want to remind everybody that you know this actually is a rather calm deadline day in in reference to the last few seasons because so much of that work was done early on levin yeah. was brought in weeks ago being able to do a full preseason kunde was the last one to be brought in but you know kessier and christensen done basically last season you know march april yeah. may those were agreed to even this marcus alonso deal that we're going to talk about those that contract and that agreement was signed on personal terms between the player and the club that being barcelona and alonso months ago like back in february we fo- first saw that yeah report. i feel like that's been looming for like a year yeah, yeah. On personal terms, right so this is basically a guarantee that was kicked down the road until they could actually confirm that they could register and, and, and do this so all right let's go through these deals basically one by one starting with the fullback position because yeah it's a fullback kind of day did mm-hmm. Xavi get the big, you know, the big player he wanted or the big name? I think the minute Juan Forth went down with that injury for Villarreal, then it was always going to be the, the B, C, D, E, F, G options. Um, but the player that's going out in that stead is Sergio Dest. He is quite confirmed. AC Milan, his time at Barcelona is over, even though it's a loan. It's a loan with a buy option around 20 million euros, and it's not a mandatory buy option, but it's a deal until june of 2027 uh which does tell you or it's a one-year loan plus a potential four-year deal which does tell you that you know dest if he has any signs of life at ac milan they will purchase him just to even resell him at a portion of of what he's worth because i want to remind everybody that that young fullback market you know for those this is where my stance has been on dest for a while his positional play is lacking his final third ball is lacking, and he's not the player that Xavi wants in that position, especially when you bring in Lewandowski, you bring in Kessier, you renew Dembele. You have a summer where you you build a team to win a Champions League and win La Liga and win everything, and Dest is still just too far behind even the rest of the young talent. All the other teenagers, all the other young 20-somethings, Dest is still behind that curve for Xavi. And so you've got to, that being the club, make financial uh, good on, on, that, on that player. And so get 20 million a year from now for Dest is going to be, again, a fair market value if he continues to, to not advance his career the way that we would hope that he did or expect that he did. The other half of that, though, is, again, the reason why Dest was, was, was sold was because that young fullback market is a disaster. It's a wasteland. There's no one there. It's the same five names you hear, Frimpong and Gusto. And, I mean, Reese James is 22 for Chelsea. I, but I mean, the, the list of players that are under 22 years old at the right back spot that we'll say have high potential or that you could truly just count on and say that's going to be a future star. There's nobody. There's nobody out there. Uh, and so they just they had to get rid of him. I mean, look at the rest of the people they were trying to bring in before Bellarine. Thomas Moynier, 31 this month. He looks set to split time at Dortmund with 27 year old Marius Wolf. Uh, Matteo Mori is still just 22 at Dortmund, but he's quite injury prone. And Felix Passlock is also a right back, two years left in his contract. And that's why Munir didn't leave because Dortmund has four right backs. And yet they don't really trust one of them in perpetuity. And then the next name was Julian Araujo, who just turned 22 for the LA Galaxy. And people know I work for ML- I work for and with MLS. He's already made 102 professional appearances, Barca Academy in Arizona products. So he has kind of been on their radar or been in the quote unquote system for quite some time. One goal, just 12 assists, three of those coming this year in 2,500 minutes. But even Julian Rahu, who is like a, who's his prospect, you know, the LA Galaxy know what he's worth. And they obviously, when Barca said, hey, can we get this player for Barca Athletic? Likely, they offered two to three million or 3.5 or four or whatever because he's an international. I know the Galaxy came back and said, give us eight to 12 because that's the market for fullbacks, 100%. So maybe they'll kick the can down the road and, and come back to that. But I don't know, that young fullback that everyone is talking about that's supposed to be brought in and going to be the savior, that player doesn't exist. And that's why Xavi said, just get me somebody serviceable, get me somebody who's older, and uh, and yeah, and give me Hector Bellerin because he's a free transfer. And especially looking at Capology stuff, a free transfer for low wages for Bellerin, that was a deal. That was a deal. Well, especially at this point, I mean, if you need, yeah, like you said, the the young prospect, that, that kind of, the unicorn type of prospect just isn't around right now and like you said the given the dearth across you know across europe across the global game if there was such a player available the price would be astronomical and more yeah, than almost 70 i want to remind people that kukurea was like 70 million euros yeah exactly 
And so if if it's someone on the level of Kukureya, that's what you're dealing with. And it might even be higher now because you don't even have the break you know, break glass for Kukureya instead of emergency option because he's off the market. So in this case, I mean, I think, uh, I don't know if there is like an entire crop of, you know, young, high upside talented right backs coming, but right now the game is just uh, bridges and, you know, make sure that bridges and stop gaps and make sure that you have capable bodies there and, you know, you get, you get through the season and you achieve at least some of what you're trying to achieve. Um... You know, like a lot of team building has has been done. I mean, I think the you know whether it was in terms of just getting younger or flat out getting better, the the side has made you know big strides this summer. Um, whatever, it's fine if some sort of an idealized solution isn't found for every single gap on the roster. Now you just need to find someone that you know you've got a really good team. You just have to make sure that you don't have a fatal flaw at at right back and. The, the rest of the roster should, you know, deliver you to some sort of success at the end of all of this. Yeah, how do you say goodbye to, to Dest? Uh, again, I, I've been very biased about him. I, I tried to die on that hill many times with Eric Garcia. Mm-hmm. And I think when he was healthy, he gave you something. But mm-hmm. it, 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 I think Xavi was given an option at the start of the summer and said, which players are you not going to protect? You know, almost like an expansion yeah. draft, right? Like a yep. like transfer draft where Xavi, you know, named the players that you want to keep. And we kind of know who those are and who are you willing to part with? And I think Des was put on that list of guys he was willing to part with for the right price. Uh, and again, I think that's what it comes down to even more so than, you know, we don't have to justify him not making it Barcelona and saying, oh, he stinks. Like, that's why he didn't make it at Barcelona. I think there's a lot of reasons why not only players don't work out, but you have to get rid of those players. And I yeah. think that that's kind of what happened with Des, where he was the, the man to leave for that moment. Yeah. I mean, I don't. Yeah, I don't think it was a. I don't think it was an epic failure or anything like that. I don't think that. I you know I think in a different system or just with a with a change of scenery possibly even, he has you know a legitimate chance to carve out a niche for himself. I don't know if he's a future star, but he has you know he's still young and he has a lot of physical tools. I mean maybe under the right manager and surrounded by the right. You know the right cast of characters. I mean, he might, he might yet be a a very good or star level player. But even if he's not that, I mean, I think he's got he's got a career. He's yeah. You know, we watched him. We watched him play. He didn't. He didn't become the the player that he was brought in to be. At the same time, he was also brought in sort of at peak. I mean, I don't. It's tough to say even when sort of peak chaos was for this for this club, like over the past, you know, year and a half, two years, but it, it was right before El Clasico. It was like, yeah. And it was, but he was brought in under, you know, sort of the latter ish stages of Kuman. Like it was already kind of clear that Kuman wasn't, wasn't long for the dugout. And so, you know, he came in under, under that set of circumstances. And then when Javi came in too, you know, maybe he was already out on him or whatever it was, or, but I do think the objective was we need to salvage this season and I don't have a chance to spend a few weeks or whatever auditioning guys and figuring out exactly what I've got. This is all hands. We need to make sure, you know, top four, top two, whatever. And, you know, and then whatever happened over the summer, it was, yeah, Chavi was not enamored of him. And uh, look, I think for all involved, it's it's kind of a decent set of circumstances. I mean, Barca effectively get to recoup what they spent on the player and the player gets to go to the defending Serie A champions. And, you know, if it, if it goes well for him, he's, you know, a, a solid, maybe frontline player at a, at a huge club, at a trophy winning club. Yeah. Well, personally, as someone who's going to be hoping that the U S men's national team can do well at the world cup in Qatar, you know, mm-hmm. Serginho just actually playing football is going to be important to that. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, I'm excited to see what the American can do again. He was the first American to play at Barca. Technically it was Conrad de la Fuente in a preseason game, but that's just for the, uh, the, the real deep divers on the trivia, but the player coming in instead is Hector Bellerin, who gets the call left Barcelona at 16 or was it 14 then returns home, you know, went to Arsenal when he was a teenager 
But, you know, you just wonder if he's doing it like Adama Traore did or if it's going to look a little more like Eric Garcia. Um, but what we do know is the, it's a one-year contract with no option for, for the season, which is really interesting, which is, you know, one-year deal, no option to extend. Um, he will sign until June of 2023. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because he stayed relatively healthy last season, played 32 games for Real Betis as their regular starter, providing five assists, and he was a regular starter and sometimes captain for Arsenal the year before when they were uh, yeah, struggling. But yeah, he's 27, so technically he's in the prime of his career, but he's had had enough of injuries where he just looks like he's on the second half of his career already at 27, which is a shame. But yeah, you wonder what player is in there. Um, but I also say, like, not to say they don't wonder, but my stance on the Bellarine signing is it's a fine depth piece. You know, if we begin this conversation with the way we started the show, and that is with that capology, and with the limitations that Barcelona have financially, especially if you've already, again, we've had to add an addendum in here because of another bomb or big player that Laporta and, and Jared Romero at the moment are speaking about. But Bellerin is going to, to play a role to do a job. And again, I, I say that all of our conversations are always leading us to a Gala 11 or to playing El Clasico or playing in the Champions League knockout. That's always what we're talking about. And a, a reminder, too, that Araujo will probably start again against Vinny Jr. on the wing in El Clasico. We probably will see that again because it worked so well last season, a 4 nothing, and it seemed to work in the preseason as well. Is it a long-term option, against, especially against teams that sit in a low block? No, obviously. That experiment has failed in teams that are playing narrow and especially teams that are playing narrow and playing in medium to low blocks. Um, but that said, you know, over the course of a year, you kind of need everybody in a squad. And you know, there is nothing about Hector Bellerin of what I saw last year that indicates to me that he's going to leapfrog even Sergio Roberto on the depth chart. I think you're going to see a healthy diet of Kunde, who again probably doesn't want to play right back. You know, Alan Al really said it last week. So if Kunde isn't an option, but maybe he's willing to fill in occasionally when he's truly needed to in the most important games, then you have Araujo probably at right back in that rotation. You have Kunde, and those two together at right back are playing, or it's a three at the back in those biggest, most important games, and they're playing what? maybe seven or eight, ten of the games, the two of them combined at that position. And then for the rest of it, you've got 20 to 25 other starts or, or even coming on a halftime for Roberto and for Bellerin. And I think both of those players, Roberto and Bellerin, can fill those roles and do those jobs. You know, so I don't think Bellerin really moves that needle, but I think he can just be, you know, if they're signing him to be guy 21, 22, 23 on the roster... You can do a lot worse than Hector Bellerin, who was, again, the starter for Real Betis. It was a good team last year. You know, so again, it doesn't excite me, but it does a job. And on a free transfer for just one season, like 27 years old, returns home to, <laughs> to an environment he knows, like, you could do a lot worse than Hector Bellerin. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I don't think it's realistic to, he, he is not a savior. I mean, I don't know, if, you know, even in... Yeah circumstances like you know at arsenal where he kind of he knows where everything is he's been there forever i mean he's not a star and they don't view him as such and so um yeah i mean i think he's kind of an interesting counter to a lot of the arrivals that at barca this the summer which have been you know i mean it's just been all you know massive difference makers and stars and names and you know I mean, he's, Hector Bayerin is a name and, you know, he's, he's a star in terms of, you know, name recognition and Q score and stature, but I mean, he is a player. He's, he's a useful player when he's healthy. Um, and sometimes that's what you need. It's, um, in particular, I mean, this, this team isn't really positioned to, you know, it's a role that they need to fill, and it's a position that we just talked about isn't chock full of star level players to bring in. And secondly, we don't even know if the team would be in a position. Like, is it even feasible to bring in a star level player? You know, I mean, right now we're just getting into the nitty gritty of, I mean, we're not even into it, but as we get into the nitty gritty of the season, you need people to play these positions. Like you, now we're getting into the part where you have to satisfy your fixture commitment and, right. you know, you need, you need bodies, you need, you know, good teammates and willing runners and stuff like that. And Hector Barian is a 
good pro who it's inexplicable to me that he's still 27 like i i felt like he was i when i looked it up i thought he was going to be like 33 but um you know he's he's a good he's a good solid pro to bring in and as i was telling you before we actually started recording here i mean i i think there's an outside chance that given everything you see about him and everything i've read about him and um you know I think the value that he'll deliver from a purely vibes perspective could, you know, possibly rival or, you know, equal or surpass his on pitch value as well. Because by all accounts, I mean, he's a, he's a good teammate. He's, you know, an ex Barca guy. And, you know, as such, he wants to come back to, I can imagine he will be absolutely a sort of a, a, a good a good soldier and a good conduit for um Xavi's message and Xavi's tactics you know so he he'll be a, a respected veteran that isn't going to be you know side eyeing anything that the manager says much to the contrary he's actually going to be one hundred percent on board and bringing everyone else with him yeah again the the bearing it goes down to expectations what are what are our expectations mm -hmm. for him this season? And I think if you, not to say lower your expectations, but if you assume that he is potentially even the backup, quote unquote, right back, or part of this deeper mm -hmm. right back rotation, depending on the personnel and depending on the opponent, then that's just fine. Now, especially yep. to the other side, to left back, I think this is where things get more complicated and, mm -hmm. and much more interesting. Because again, I think when we're talking about the right back spot, you're talking about next summer, yeah. um, probably not even in January. You're talking about next summer, some big number to bring in a, a, a consummate starter, right? To really go on the market, and that's your priority, along with potentially a defensive midfielder. Um, though, to give you another update here, the latest we're seeing is Marathi for PSG is the quote unquote surprise. Uh, and uh, for all the midfielders that PSG have signed, yeah, maybe there's some credibility to that, but okay, I don't know. That, that probably is always squashed by this point. But speaking of big signings that may happen but did not, Jordi Alba was linked to Inter Milan yesterday in something that I can only assume was put out there because, again, when the cap spiked and Jordi Alba was making what he made and PK and Sketch are like, nah, and De Young said, I'm not leaving, then, I mean, of those big, big, big numbers, right? Like, something has to give, and Jordi Alba's been frozen out so far in the case of Balde. And if you're PK, you're like, well, of course. I mean, Sarajo is Kunde. Of course I'm not playing. But in the case of Jordi Alba, he's like, well, this kid's like 18. He was injured all of last year. What's happening? Why am I sitting on the bench, and Marcus Alonso on the way. And apparently, 40% of Alba's salary was to be paid by Inter, meaning Barca was still going to be paying 60% of Jordi Alba's salary, but even getting 60% of, or 40% of that off the books, as we see now, is completely essential to what Barca was trying to do. But it seems like Alba was like, no, 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 I'm staying too. That's, like, I'm going to fight for my spot. Like, why am I going to move? You're not going to un unsettle me right now. Um, now, playing into that, of course, is the Marcus Alonso thing, which is real which is where this gets pretty complicated, right? Like, we figured that if Bellerin or some other right back was coming in, then Des was likely gone. And there was truth to that. It made sense on both sides. But with Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, I, I guess that's where we start instead of the whole back spot, uh, start, uh, uh, spot here, I should say. Aubameyang to Chelsea, along with Marcos Alonso to Barca, for 14 million euro fee to Barcelona, plus Marcos Alonso. And Alonso seems to be making somewhere between four and six million euros at Barca uh, to, again, be a rotation piece, a squad piece. And I don't know if he's the actual consummate left back starter. More likely, he's the starter than Bayerine is on the right side. Um, but yeah, it, it, interesting. Uh, not only interesting about the left back stuff, but let's start with Aubameyang. That's awesome. That's an awesome deal for Aubameyang. It's yes. terrible what happened to him. That break in. Yes. Robert the broken jaw. That is grotesque. Like, I mean, that yeah, is... I, I have nothing to say about that. Like, that's yeah. just that news. Like, just, like, it's a bad thing that happened. And yeah. I think it's actually even fortunate for Aubameyang. It's very fortunate for Barcelona, obviously, and for Chelsea that that situation didn't affect the transfer. And it's one of those, like... It's one of those situations where what a nightmare of a day. What a terrible day. And yet, you still have to go about business as usual. And I think for Aubameyang to go through that traumatic experience and then still have the ability to complete this life-changing move to, I mean, I get back to London. So maybe he was able to get his old flat back, um, you know, and he was only in Barcelona for six months. But either way, like for Aubameyang to go through that traumatic experience and then to be able to say, hey, I still 
went through this today and I still have to think about myself for the next months and year. And so let me do what I need to do, even though I'm going through this big thing and I have a broken jaw and all this is going on. So, I mean, credit to him as a human being, as a professional to get this done. And again, like, you know, it's not going to be forgotten what happened to him for him, you know, but, you know, I'm hoping six months from now he's able to go, okay, I still made the right move for my life. And Barcelona is obviously, I mean, they're, they must be over the moon to get 14 million for a player that came on reduced wages for six months and helped them make the Champions League. What, what a perfect, perfect signing Aubameyang was. Oh, it really was. I mean, he, yeah, exactly. He came on reduced wages. Um, he's going to get more expensive. And he was, you know, by all accounts, a, you know, a good guy around the club, a good teammate. He linked up again with Usman Dembele, and they, you know, kind of re kind of reconjured a little bit of that the old Dortmund days, and he was I thought he was fantastic for for Barca, um, even knowing all the financial stuff that he was going to get more expensive, and that's not you know super tenable for Barca. I felt really bad you know that that he had to leave because I actually you know I I kind of I really sort of took to him you know <laughs> I took a shine to him. Um, I, yeah, what happened to him in his home is absolutely inexcusable, and I don't even know, it, like, there's just, there's nothing that I can say that, you know, isn't either just hilariously obvious or not vulgar about about that. So, you know, we can just leave that there. I mean, just, you know, hopefully, yeah, hopefully that doesn't completely mar both his memory and experience of having been here and you know i mean i just hope he himself and his family are okay both physically and i mean honestly just emotionally psychologically in the yeah. in the longer run too uh, but yeah i mean from the uh, from the pure kind of um on pitch slash boardroom level yeah i mean this worked out ideally he, you know we talked about it when he came here he was a little bit of a fading star who needed to revive his image and show that he still had something in the tank. Barca needed someone with something in the tank who wasn't going to demand a whole ton of money but could score goals for them. And each side got exactly what they wanted. And yeah, I mean, I can only imagine he was happy living in London before. So he gets to go back and live in London. Yeah. He gets to play Champions League football. And... Yeah, I mean, Barca actually got. I mean, this is this is a the the rare piece of super tidy business that, that Barca have done lately. That, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of a, a chef's kiss, like you said. I mean, it's sort of all around. It's a it's a win 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 all around. Yeah, I mean, then now there's a lot of chaos now at left back. I think for Alonso, you know, he comes in. A reminder too that he started or played sixty five percent of matches and minutes for Chelsea last season. And, you know, it, it seemed like for a player that could be that, that contributed five goals, six assists and 46 matches uh, this season as well, or sorry, last season that, you know, he's able to do, he's serviceable. He's able to do all of what I think is required of him. He does win a lot of his aerial duels. His progressive passing numbers are really good. Shot creating actions are really good. Shot number is very high. So when it comes to teams that Barcelona are going to need to try to overwhelm and really go at, I think... Uh, Alonso is going to make some sense. He can also play as a left center back, so there's versatility there. I mean, looking at the fullback market, Barcelona could have done a lot worse than Marcos Alonso, and I think the opposition to it is because, yeah, he's 31, and you're kind of locking up something that is, is worrisome, but if you know that Alejandro Balde, and it's only been three matches and a preseason, but if Balde really is the future, which it looks like, it looks like at this point, like I was concerned that Barcelona were going to sell him with a buyback clause somewhere in there, right? Now it seems like even if he doesn't get minutes right now because Alonso and Alba splitting time and Alba's going to force his way to stick around, then Balde will go on loan and probably succeed. And Balde knows that eventually that job is his. And if he can lock, like locking that idea, and a lot changes in football too. Like a lot changes from month, from window to window and year to year. But if, if everyone kind of is on the same page, even Alonso and Alba, that Balde is going to be starting eventually, or like when the club chooses, or when Xavi chooses that to happen, 
I don't know if it's going to be this year because, again, having three now left backs and an album making what he makes, it just it, it, it seems untenable to me as a situation. But, you know, so I think if I had to be, you know, look at my crystal ball, my guess is that Balde does not get enough time as a first team starter this year or as a first team player in the fall at least and then he goes out on loan but very much like Nico Gonzalez it's one of those like hey we're not sending you like you know what your job is to do to go out on loan and it's more of a see you later we're definitely we'll see you later you'll likely get at least another full season in the first team before we really make a decision on your future because you should be part of our future just go and do your job on loan and let's see how you can handle that pressure while we sort this stuff out here aka Jordi Alba so all of that actually does make sense. Now, I'm I'm curious with the Jordi Alba thing. So, okay, so Alba's not going to not gonna agree to leave. He's not going to enter whatever, so he's going to stay. It's now been made abundantly clear that for reasons, financial, tactical, or otherwise, he's not part of the plans. I mean, Javi, you know, wants him gone, or wants him gone enough, at least. And... He doesn't have a, I was going to say he doesn't have a clear role, but it would appear he doesn't have a role in the future of the club. Why, uh, I mean, I realize we just went through the entire sort of the the umtiti odyssey of, you know, paying someone loads and loads of cash to to not play. But if your objective is to move on from the Jordi Alba era, era and... Balde is showing at least flashes. You know, he's definitely he's not not the the left back of the future. And agreed. Look again, once and more, looking at that young fullback market. Yep. Like all day, I want to remind you, like just I know it's kind of nonsense, but look at like the uh, the gold.com like next gen yeah. top one, which again is always wrong. Like Balde is arguably a top five, maybe top three under twenty two left back prospects in world in world football. Like yeah. that's like that's how shallow we'll say that is. It's just such a hard sure. position to predict. Just such a h- impossible position to predict. So, to that point, if you think this guy actually has has a decent chance to be the left back of the future, um, and and the left back of the now, and you're pulling off a deal that gets you not just the money for Obama Young, but also Marco Alonso. Is there anything wrong with just seeing, looking at Jordi Alba as a as a sunk cost, and just saying that you know what we're going to we're going to basically feed the feed the youth on the left and see what we have in Balde, and as our veteran cover for him, or you know, or vice versa, um, we have Alonso, and. Look, you can you can keep collecting the paycheck. You don't like this. This isn't happening anymore. We're not we're not doing this anymore. Does that does that make sense? Am I missing something? Like because financially it all nets out to the same thing. I mean, all the stays you have to pay them. Fine, but as far as actually moving the club forward and not having to deal with any of this as a distraction, I mean, I think it's easier to just be like, look, we we committed to this money. We said we were going to do this thing. We. have the bill came due. Fine, we'll pay you, but you know we're we're going to see what we have in the prospect and this other guy that we've been trying to get for basically a year, who's talented and can you know effectively I guess play your role. 